and people ask, hey, how come how come the EV sound like UFO? Uh-huh. <laughs> so how do we know when a Blue SG comes back with the <laughs> sound comes along with it? It's pretty really iconic, no? <laughs> yeah, so iconic, so iconic, but I, I absolutely love it. If I ask most of you to think about cartoons, many of you will think about Mickey Mouse. When we ask most Singaporeans to think about EVs, the first picture that comes in the head are these Blue SG cars. So we know that the world is transitioning to EVs. Tesla is leading the way with private car ownership, as well as robo-taxis in the future when full self-driving comes to play. But today, I'm here with Jenny, who is the country manager of Blue SG, to learn about whether there is a role to play for an EV car sharing company. Now, a little bit of context here. We're here in Singapore, where car ownership rates are a lot less lower. In the US, we have 80% car ownership. Europe, 50%. Down here, it's only 11%. Public transportation is amazing. Now, car sharing also isn't an easy business. The previous parent company, Bolloré Group, had car sharing uh, in Paris, in LA, and London. And it didn't always succeed in other regions. Scaling was hard especially in places with high car ownership. So we wonder whether Singapore, a small urban island nation with less than 6 million people, going from one end of the island end to in 45 minutes, with a low car ownership rate, would be a good place for Blue SG to succeed. So we're going to learn about Blue SG's history, how they started, where they are today, and the big milestones, as well as their future plans. Jenny, thank you for being here today. Blue SG just celebrated your fourth anniversary and your three million rental. Big milestones. Tell us more about yourself and Blue SG. Thank you for inviting. Blue SG, as you have rightfully said, has just celebrated our fourth year anniversary. So um, myself, I've been with the company for ages. So we, though we are four years old, but um, I was part of the founding team. So I'm um, incidentally also the co-starter of the service. So prior to 2017, you know, uh, I started working on this project in around 2000. 12, 2013, on the scoping of the project, on the education of the project, and the bidding, the tenders, you know, and the negotiation of the project. So eventually, we launched the project on 12, 12, 2017, and then it is on the path of no return. We actually today we have close to about 700 cars. So we are we now have a new shareholder, which is Gobel, um, since October. And we have locations, uh, our stations are located island-wide across 383 locations with more than 1,500 charging points Yes, and growing. So big growth, now there's private car ownership, there's public transportation. What's Blue SG's dream? So when we first conceptualized Blue SG, we had a simple objective. It's to be able to plug the gap when it comes to short rides the heartland locations where you know it is far the first mile last mile yeah. you know and at the same time to be affordable to be sustainable so that's the reason why we put together with this ev car sharing and as you know you know um in singapore car ownership is expensive so the best way to allow singaporeans to be able to drive uh, and yet not pay so much is ev car sharing so what we wanted to is simply to offer an affordable, efficient, A to B, and yet sustainable service. So that was our simple objective. Jenny talked about affordable and sustainable. In Singapore, cars are three times more expensive compared to US car prices because of high vehicle ownership taxes. And renting a car costs a lot less than buying a car here. For instance, a Tesla Model 3 starts at 140,000 US dollars. With this journey, Back then, four years ago, EVs were very new to Singapore. Yes. People were super skeptical. Yes. Tell us what was this experience like for you and the team? So it was a tedious experience. It was fun. It was rewarding because every single... I remember when we first launched, we launched with um, 80 cars, 32 locations. So after that, we celebrated every little milestone. So we celebrated when we reached 100 stations, mm-hmm. then 500 stations. So, and uh, our biggest celebration was when we reached our 1 million rentals. So every single milestone is worth celebrating because um, the team put in so much hard work. And being the first mover, uh, we also had to went through a lot of teething moments. 
Uh, but thankfully, we have um, the very supporting uh, uh, land use agencies as well as EDB and LTA. So together with these supportive, uh, supportive agencies, you know, we managed to reach where we are and they were also very um, accommodating, you know, in terms of helping us, in terms of working the journey with us, especially the first two years. From the growing part to the expansion part, you know, we also need to ensure, you know, we have the right strategies, find the right location. And there are many locations where we found with, there's not even sufficient charging power. So, you know, there is the chicken and the egg, you know, thing. you want the location, you know the location works, it's, it's good, but there's not enough power. Then there's another place where there's plenty of power, but you, you're you not so sure that the location is going to work. And then after that, where do you put the cars? You know, when do you bring in enough number of cars? Yeah, so we there was no right formula because we were the first ones doing this. So we just had to try and error. Talk about where to put the cars in those early days. Back then, as the fleet was still building, there was a phenomenon that some users are saying. In the mornings and weekdays, the cars from the heartlands would go down the CBD, so parking there would be harder. Yes. Then evenings, it's the reverse flow. Yes. yes. How did your team handle that? Actually, we tried to do um, also fleet balancing, but I think what is more amazing is uh, we have very smart users. So uh, our members, our users, they also could see the trend. Yes. So a lot of them, they beat the trend. Right. So, for example, if the peak period starts at 8 o'clock, a lot of them you will see they start going out of the house earlier. Huh. Yeah. So, they start going into the stations earlier. And then, because as we open the station uh, more and more uh, along the months, along the years, the network effect steps in. So, when you have the network effect, it's easier because if they want to, for example, park at Stanley Street, Stanley Street has no station, no place, they can go to Republic Plaza, yeah. or if not, they can go to Esplanade. Then after that is the balance of, uh, am I willing to walk five minutes more, right. ten minutes more? But but I think we are we are very lucky that our customers generally don't mind walking a little bit to reach the cars. So we even have customers who feedback to us, you know, in a very positive way that they even took three bus stops, two MRT stations wow. to our stations. But because they know that it makes sense. And after that, they are going to use the car, you know, to do errands, you know, drop offs and all. So it makes sense. It's worth the, it's worth the, 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 the challenge. Yeah. Now, just like how Mickey Mouse is an iconic character for the Walt Disney Company, this blue car behind us is an iconic character of Blue SG. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about the blue car? Yes. So the blue car was uh, one of the Bolloré blue car that is used across all the car sharing service, you know, under Bolloré. When Bolloré stopped the car sharing across the world, they also stopped manufacturing the blue car. So this is typically one of its last kind around. And uh, for us, we are lucky that we still have access to quite a number of these blue cars and we will be able to use them for quite a while. And, but otherwise, uh, moving forward, we will be injecting new models uh, into the fleet. Yes. So our users can experience and look forward to new version of EVs that is, that is totally different. And on top of that, uh, we are also looking at increasing the different number of models. Yeah. But coming back to the blue car, um, just like all EVs, the maintenance costs and the way to drive a blue car uh, or EV is actually very straightforward. You know, um, it's straight line acceleration, there's no talk, it's very quiet. And what is more important is there's less movable parts in the EV. So maintenance costs across the board is generally lower. Yeah. And there's a, a myth to bus here as well because people always have this talk when I look at social media. Is the blue car quiet or is the blue car noisy? So the truth is the blue car is quiet, yet not so quiet. So why? Um, there's this little artificial humming sound that is injected into the car that will comes on uh, um, when the car goes below 30 kilometers because um, it is an EU safety feature to inform people when the car is at the crowded places that, hey, look, a car is coming. Because Traditionally, an EV generally is quiet. So when you compare it to an ICE car, um, for an ICE car, you will hear the sound of the engine before you see the car. So right. people know that a car is coming. Here, this is um, the way, it, uh, back then, their way of informing. But of course, now the standards are different. Yeah, But it's iconic. <laughs> it is. So we've talked a lot about the blue car, it's iconic hum. So right now, I'm going to transition to a segment where I talk to a blue car user, Joelle. I'm riding with her. As you watch this segment, you'll learn a little bit more about the car, the riding experience, 
and we'll come back talk with Jenny about the present. I'm now here in the blue car with a user of Blue SG. So can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi Darren. Um, I'm Joel, and I've been with Blue SG for I don't know ever since it started ish. <laughs> About four years now. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, time flies. And uh, yeah, I've been using it. And I think it's great. Yeah. So, Joel is not an employee of Blue SG. I'm just here to get a user's experience. So, I'll be getting a first hand experience of Joel driving his car, talking about her thoughts on using it. But let's first start with how do you get started knowing about Blue SG? Um, it was, I've always loved driving. Uh, and uh, we didn't own a car, I think because we did the math and we yeah. decided, okay, the loans are really expensive, it doesn't make sense in Singapore, um, and I think we can save money from mm. there. So um, my mom was really nice and uh, she knew that I really love driving and she introduced Blue SG to me. She said, hey girl, go and uh, check it out. She uh, just said, but mom typically just sends a link over. La. So I oh, okay, okay, you can. I go take it out. Um, applied it. It took about three days of mm. process to get it out, and yeah, that's how I started. So and thanks, mommy. <laughs> our parents always try to do their best for us exactly. in this case. Like, would you have imagined yourself driving a car rental? Um, in fact, I did. Uh. So the moment I actually got my first, um, the moment I got my driver's license, uh. I decided to do a garage thing and rented a car. Uh worst experience ever because it was so scary yeah. i was alone i wanted to go alone and try it out uh. and uh and i was trying to adjust to it last so mm. i do do rental cars like those uh, typical um one day type of rental like 60 dollars yeah. that you haven't paid for your parking you haven't paid for your petrol so by the time it's like 60 dollars right mm. everything add up together it's probably what 100, 120 a day wow. or two days. Sometimes it could, uh, depending on how much petrol you actually use, uh, how much errands you're running. I and, see. So you've driven both, okay, like EVs and also internal combustion engine yes. cars. In driving school, we have to learn all petrol cars exactly. as well. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience with this car? Like when you first got in, what were your initial impressions about it? Right. I'm so... going to go behind the camera now. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, simple actually. Um, I when I did my driving driving license, I took the uh, uh, manual. The manual, so of course you got a clutch. Yeah, of of course over here, that's different. It means automatic, right? So there are only two pedals: the <laughs> accelerator and the brakes. It's just that I find that Blue SG really feels like a go kart. Huh. Just that it's faster, <laughs> like a golf cart, but it's faster. But by go means go, the moment that you just release the acceleration pedal, you would feel like, whoa, okay, there's a significant drop in in, in the acceleration. You was, it, it feels like a mini brake. Huh. Yeah, when I haven't even bro broke. So we can I'll try that later and then you can experience how it feels like. Yeah. And um I personally I think from a normal car to a blue SG, uh, there are also a lot of myths to say yeah. that all oh, blue SG doesn't have power. Uh. I mean, in Singapore, how fast do you go? La? Yes. <laughs> I mean, the, the top max of this car is typically 115. Okay. Uh, around there. And uh, I mean, in Singapore, that's breaking the law already. Mm -hmm. So let's not go there. <laughs> and um, I, I find that it's good enough to travel around Singapore. It's it's just powerful enough to do so. It gets you from a destination. From A to B. That's yeah. it. Yep. And this island is one end to another end is 45 minutes. Without traffic jam. Exactly, without traffic jam. So you add traffic jam. I traveled before, uh, sent a friend home at the far side of Pandan, all the way until Pasir Ris. It's a one hour plus. Wow. Of a normal drive, some traffic in there. So, yeah. And in the early days of Blue Ashi, a lot of people were wondering how to turn on the aircon of this car. Exactly. Can you show us how? <laughs> I know it's very warm. Okay, so it happened to me too. It was really warm. So I'm gonna turn off the car and I'm gonna turn it on again. Mm. Yeah, so okay, I can feel the difference. It's very hot. Okay, so over here, if you can see the dashboard, right? There isn't any anything going on. Yes. There's no lights or anything, and we automatically illuminate. It's actually at thirty six degrees Celsius. I don't know. Oh. I okay. So what I do is just very simple. Just press the AC. Yeah, and that's it. And then you press go. The AC button. You have to press behind. the AC button. Yeah. Uh. I don't know, but I think that because it's an international car. So automatically overseas is a little bit warm. So they don't automatically turn on the aircon the moment you turn on. I, I have no idea. Yeah, but you have fun. to always go back to this. 
<laughs> yeah, because this car is originally from Europe. Exactly. So they got the different seasons, right? Like yes. Winter, they probably want the heater yes, rather exactly. than the cooler. Exactly, they want the winter more than the cooler. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so um, my friends and I, when we when we take the car, especially my partner, so he knows already, he knows the drill. Uh. Um, I will adjust my seat and he will turn on the aircon. <laughs> Tag team. <laughs> Tag team, yes. <laughs> At- as a driver, how do you use all these different consoles in a car? Um, I'll be honest, you just have to read. Um, yeah. We don't typically touch this. Uh-huh. It just indicates uh, your your gears. Yeah, so of course you know your gears. Yes, uh, so the simple, M, the R, very L, simple. The R, simple ones. Yeah. You've got um, your battery on the right. Battery on the right, yeah. yeah. So you just make sure that uh, you kind of have to gauge properly like, how you mm. drive. But I'll be honest, with the 88%, um, no problem driving four hours. I see. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Yeah, I've ever had the five hours rental before. So I had to run some errands. Mm-hmm. Um, a ninety percent, ninety, ninety, ninety to ninety five percent is mm-hmm. good enough. Yeah. So if like, say we are at eighty seven now, yeah. should last no more than about four hours, depending on how much we drive. <laughs> okay, let's take it for a spin. Yeah, it's okay. Awesome. Okay. So. Well, heading right now. So we're in the east of. Singapore, we're just taking a spin around a lot of these very nice legacy shop houses. It's a moderate traffic day on a weekday afternoon. So we're just leaving a blue SG station. There are typically about how many cars at every station, you'd say? Um, it depends. Actually, there are about uh, four different charging ports. Some have two, some have three, but those are the rare ones. Mm. Majority of them are four. Mm. Yeah. And we also hear from users like, because normally when people rent Blue SG, right. they would rent it in the morning from HDB areas, yes. public housing, to go to office in yes. CBD. Yes. So I've tried that before. Mm. I, I, I'll be honest, sometimes getting a Blue SG car is really my luck. Uh, yeah, especially if in, in the morning to the to town, it's fine. But the problem is the parking. Really, are you able to find a certain sort of parking uh, available? So always pre-book yourself first yeah yeah because yeah, everyone wants to come to town on weekday mornings uh, exactly uh, oh you can try um for example weekends yeah um you can try the afternoon evenings mm. almost close to no parkings I see. <laughs> So I think like matching that supply and demand is one of the tricky parts of the exactly. car rental business. So you definitely need to take a look at um, how, what, what is the consumer behavior like? What, uh, how are people driving? Do you have thoughts? And actually by the time you use uh, Blue SG for maybe about say a month, yeah. you actually get to see what are their behaviors like. And earlier, Jenny was mentioning like below 30 kilometers an hour, you will hear the hum for safety yes. then after 30 then the hum goes away can i say something cool about ev yes my partner, start, sit, my partner and i said something really cool about do you know that this is not real that all these humming sounds these are it's actually um orchestrated do you know there are sound technicians who yeah. actually orchestrate these sounds huh. yeah so really really ultra cool about evs is that there are such orchestrated sounds. Then people ask, hey, how, come, how come the EV sound like UFO? Uh-huh. <laughs> so how do we know when a uh, Blue SG comes back? Like, <laughs> it comes along with it. It's pretty iconic, no? Yeah, so iconic, so iconic. But I, I absolutely love it because actually this a sound like that, right? Um, it can be orchestrated. I love the sound engineers for me. Yeah. Um, it's a safety, it's a safety, um, feature as well because mm. EVs are typically very very quiet not like those uh, ICE vehicles yeah. you can hear those engines whenever they rev it you actually can hear it yes. but let me tell you EV it's if we had switched it off um, it's very difficult for nearby people to actually know that we are here yeah. so if let's say we are fast it would be rather dangerous actually and so the sound was very important I find the sound, sound engineering really cool <laughs> So for yourself, you've been using Blue SG for a couple of years. Yes. So is it safe to say that you're okay with this, that you will not own a private car? Um, honestly, even if, um, for the sake of budgeting lies, yeah. uh, and given that Singapore is really small, um, not owning a car is entirely fine. Yeah. Um, I would find that owning a car is a luxury. Yeah. 
So, uh, I mean, my company does uh, trainings for financial consultants. And, yeah. Uh, my my boss is a really really great uh, budgeting so um and he always says don't spend money right when you feel that you have to take out such a big pocket of money out of it like you Agreed. burn a hole um just in order to buy a car i mean if you like driving this is good enough yeah. um just get an experience or the wheel so that you can you know refresh yourself again yes. um, lose that ability of driving for the record, I fully agree. Even though I'm planning to get a Tesla Model Y next year, which costs about two hundred thirty thousand Sing dollars, driving and owning a private car here is a luxury. Yes. Public transportation is great. Yes, agreed. I fully agree. So Blue actually, like their mission was not to replace public transport or private car, but almost yes. like to complement public it's like transport. In between, you know? Yeah, it's in between. Huh. Yeah. So um, my friends and I actually I'm not the only driver. So yeah. um, my friends and I we actually sometimes we need to take two or three bus stops down yeah. to a nearby Blue SG station mm. to get a car. Yes. Yeah. So and and along the way, last time we felt like oh you have to walk twenty minutes to get a car. You have to take what public transport ten minutes to go and get a car. I'll be honest. After a while, it's fine. Mm. <laughs> you just gotta get used to it. It becomes a lifestyle instead of. Uh, uh, just like if driving is a lifestyle, if taking public transport is a lifestyle, then Blue SG is a lifestyle too. <laughs> yes, yeah, agree. Exactly. In the early days of Blue SG, as they were still rolling out more of their locations, yeah. people were saying, oh, it's hard for me to drive to Orchard yes. or Sentosa. Yes. So how, has you, how have you personally seen that change over the years? Um, I think one of the smartest moves Blue SG did was to do a tie-up with um, Capital Land. Uh -huh. So if you see majority of the Capital Land uh, malls right nearby or itself in the mall itself, there are Blue SG uh, uh, parking spaces. Mm. Which I find that that was a really smart move. Mm. Yeah, I mean, to a Blue SG station, I'll be like, thank you. <laughs> driver will be like, thank you. To other drivers, will be like, wow, why you take a space? Uh. <laughs> I've seen no spaces, you know, when a Blue SG like, hey, I got space. Then they all drive in NV. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's go. And now that you drive Blue SG, do you still drive other rental cars? No. How do you use it? I entirely stopped <laughs> renting other cars. Uh. Yeah, I totally stopped. Mm. Yeah, so, anyway, so you can hear this. Yes. Yeah, I'm at 69. Uh, a few seconds. So I, I think it's powerful. It's the acceleration is still relatively instant, yes. so it gives you the power that you need. Exactly, but however, there are some cars that are a bit more well maintained. Yep. Like this is actually quite a good, well maintained car. Yes. Um, acceleration not as powerful as some cars. Right. Really, yeah, there are other cars that acceleration is really great. I have never encountered one car. Oh my gosh, the acceleration was bad. Uh. So. Sometimes when you have rental cars, yeah. take a feel of how the car is. Play with the acceleration pedal when you drive out of the car park. You actually see how fast the car accelerates and how fast how fast it descends. Okay, I'm gonna release the acceleration pedal now. Mm -hmm. You can feel that it's actually slowing down so much. Yes. I'm not even pressing a brake and now I apply the brakes. So very most EVs very safe. Yeah. They have this thing called like regenerative braking. Right. So when you release, it starts to break. There are different degrees of regenerative braking depending on the car model. Oh, that's a term. Alright, mm. I better learn something. So that's why some drivers say it's like single pedal driving. You don't always need to use the brake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So sometimes, in an, um, uh, but the dangerous part of that is, um, let's say if we are in a jam. Yes. Um, okay, then I would have to say for the sake of the driver in the back, please use the brakes. Uh. <laughs> because it's a strong indicator of whether you're moving or not. Yes. Yeah, so for, only for the sake of jams, please use the brakes. Uh, I will purposely apply the brakes because it's actually an indication to the back. Uh. So don't accelerate too fast, even though I can don't do yeah. it, but you've got to do it. <laughs> so if you, accelerate, if you release the accelerator, like the, yes. the, the brake lights do not come on yet? No, it doesn't come on. See. Yeah, so that's the dangerous part of Blue SG. I mean, coming nearer, let's say, the, de the degenerative acceleration, yeah. I mean, nearer, nearer it, I, I'm hoping that you have the brake function. Yes. It will be definitely better. Um, 
but no, it doesn't. So we have to be very careful, especially in Blue SG. Um, the car functionalities and the notifications are very different from those uh, ICE cars out there, so we need to have a consideration for others too. Yeah. It handles well, it drives well, it's relatively silent as you all can hear. What's your favourite feature about this car? Favourite feature? Um, I like the fact that I can drive from point A to point B. And assuming that, let's say, if I decide to change my mind, right? Uh. I can just leave the car there. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Sometimes the car right, can be a liability to your timeline. And your day, for example, you have no idea where to park the car. Yeah. You have you are waiting to park the car. Oh, that will be a problem. Mm. And what's one thing that you wish was different about this car? What you mentioned about the, the brake lights earlier when you release the accelerator, yeah, so anything that, else? That would probably be one. Okay, one thing that I hope that the car could be better is now when you are behind an IC vehicle mm -hmm. or maybe say a garbage truck or let's say when you drive by, drive by ECB, if you wind down the window, you can actually smell the very fishy smell. Okay, the one thing about this car right, is that I can't get rid of the smell. What smell? Okay, so for example, let's say you drive behind a certain ice car yes. and there's an exhaust, right? It right. actually takes in. Ah. But it can't really expel it. So sometimes, if let's say it's really ultra bad, the yes. smell is so bad, you just probably have to wind down the window a little bit and then air out. Yeah, so the smell, that one I, I, I can fix. I, I tried all the buttons, but we can't do that. So. It's the. Uh... Indirect way of getting you to have safe follow distance. Uh. <laughs> exactly. It's like the. Mm, <laughs> so, for example, if let's say if um, a motorcyclist smokes. Yes. You can even smell it in the car. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I see. So, if, like, if it, if it drives by or you're know, stopping at the mm -hmm. traffic light, you can smell it in the car. That's the okay. Thing. When you're driving this car, so normally. How many passengers are there? Like, is it mostly yourself and your partner? Uh, myself and my partner, but I love to drive my friends. Uh -huh. I think that's one of the bonding sessions I have with friends. Typically, there are five people that can be seated in the car. In fact, at the back, it's quite comfortable. Just that um, if you're absolutely tall, <laughs> it would, you have a brush against the roof. Uh -huh. So I would advise for the tall ones, please sit in front. <laughs> and all the fun size ones behind. Yeah, fun size ones behind. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, typically if I have a friend who is slightly bigger, I will have him to sit in the front. Got it. Um, and then my smaller friends will be at the back. Yeah, but I, I would think that it's great for short distance. I mean, my friends are totally, absolutely fine with the fact that it's short distance and mm -hmm. you get to sit at the back. Yeah, so it's fine. It's good for, you know, for five people, um, taller ones, bigger ones in the front. It's rather spacious actually. Yeah. For your friends who ride on Blue SG, these blue cars are the first time. What are their typical comments or observations? Uh, typically, they will look around. Uh, yeah. They will cause safety belts because yeah. they might never experience their friend driving before. <laughs> I think that's the dangerous part. The driver is the more dangerous part than the vehicle. Mm. You know? Mm. So otherwise, it's a very functional ride. It gets people there, it can fit five people. This is a three-door hatchback compact hatchback so you can see the two doors in front for the passengers behind there's actually a latch on the front seat just yeah. to get the rest seat and there's a door behind to, to store items okay. um, so my team actually sometimes we actually require to um, get um, we have luggages yes. like huge luggages to, 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 go, to go from space to space uh, location to location so typically when I drive can put in two of the re really, really, really huge, extremely large types of uh, uh, luggages mm. and small luggages here and there. Yeah, uh, everything is entirely fine. Yeah, the space is good enough. I can see we've driven for about 15 minutes. The battery is went from 85 to 84, so again, lasts pretty long. Exactly. So, thank you for sharing us this first-hand driver's look of a Blue SG. Okay. This is my first time riding in a Blue SG car today, even though it's been here for more than four years. And he's safe. <laughs> I'm safe. He's safe. And again, as Joel mentioned, right, the, the driver plays a bigger part in a car, so credits to the driver. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> We're now back again with Jenny. We've all seen what a Blue car rides like. 
So let's talk about today and all the milestones that Blue SG has achieved. What are you and your team most proud of right now? So for us, I think what we are working very hard on is to expand the fleet uh, and, and under GoBell, we have committed to a lot of new things ahead. So um, we are also working on our regional expansion um, under our new shareholder, new owner. And uh, what is more important, we are also building um, the new Blue SG 2.0. So this consists of um, the new Blue SG app as well as the new platform that we are building which we hope that we can give our users a better whole user experience. Yeah, and uh, on top of that, you know, as what I mentioned earlier, is the new models that we are injecting and um, the massive expansion that we are working towards in the future. Yeah. So there is new ownership, there's going to be regional growth. But, and with that comes change and improvements in both the hardware and the software. Yes. Let's talk about the, the hardware first. Yes. So as we saw in the earlier video, users do have a certain wish list of how things could change in the future generation of cars. What is your team's wish list or like criteria for the next generation of cars coming to the fleet? Mm, without revealing which is the model that we are looking at because we are still in negotiations with the OEMs, but definitely we hope and we want to ensure that the car is more user friendly. Yeah, uh, perhaps have more than two doors. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that people don't have to climb to the back. Yeah, and yet remains not too big, okay. so that you know for for car sharing is easier to drive. Right. Because we must understand that uh, typically for car sharing, not all the customers are driving all day long. So they drive maybe one, two times, three times, four times a month. A month. So they may not be as used to driving compared to the ones where you drive your own car every day. So when the car is not too big, it's easier to park. Yeah. And what is more important is the whole user experience when you drive the car. That it remains comfortable, safe. Mm. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's a comfort journey for our members. Mm. Yeah? So these are a few of the key things. And of course, what is more important is to also ensure that um, the autonomy of the car because we are always looking for EVs and only EVs. Right. Yes. So we want to make sure that autonomy of the car is also longer. Yeah. Future generation of blue SG cars are going to be compact cars because they're easier to drive, so it makes it safer for drivers who are not regular drivers. So you probably won't see a large SUV anytime soon on a blue SG fleet. What's gonna to happen to the iconic car? But we are still going to keep the blue car. We are not going to you know, uh, give up on the blue car. So yeah. we are going to have different models adding on to the fleet. So the ones who still like to have the iconic hum or the humming sound, they can still choose the blue car. See, what is nice uh, in, in our app is they have the ability to decide which car they want to choose. I see. Yeah. So you can even, because the, when you go onto the app, you will be able to choose the car based on the battery level. Yeah. Right. So you can choose when you're booking from the app. So moving forward, they will be able to choose what they want. Okay. Yeah. And with new cars coming to the fleet, one requested feature by some users is uh, what are your thoughts on having, let's say, a front facing or even cabin camera? Because with car rental, accountability, cleanliness, lost goods, or stolen items is a thing. So we have heard this request repeatedly, you know, suggestion, request, com complaint in many forms over the years. Um, we, the, the, the fact that we haven't done that all this while was also because we are trying to balance the growth versus the cost. Mm. Yeah, but um, we've been hearing all this very carefully and we continue taking in this feedback seriously. I'm sure, you know, uh, at some point we will put this feedback into action. Yeah, and stay tuned. Maybe you'll see something soon. Yeah. Thank you. So your voices are being heard. Now let's transition to the software part. See, the entire automotive industry, it's kind of like the phone industry what, two decades ago when it went from Nokia to iPhones where it used to be hardware dominant, but now software and hardware are playing yeah. an equal role yeah. in the devices. Yeah. So there's a new Blue SG 2.0 app coming. Yeah. And for some companies, like say, example like Tesla, they've got like the Tesla safety score, where it looks at how many disengagements, braking, sudden accelerations, to make, to encourage and incentivize safer driving behavior. Mm -hmm. And this is quite a big part when it comes to a car, rental fleet as well. Yes. What's your take on how software can play a role in incentivizing better behaviors? So the truth is ours is a very connected car. So what a lot of people didn't know is, uh, but it's also because this car is 
it is manufactured by the ex shareholder and the, the telematic box, everything is in house. So it fits in nicely, it taps on all the signals. So this car actually detects everything and anything. Yeah. So with all the small shock sensors, the alarms, the indicators, we get all sorts of uh, data. Mm. Now, the only thing here is we haven't really translated those data into user feedback to the user. Right. Yeah. So we, we are hoping, you know, with the new 2.0, these are some of the things that we take into consideration mm. so that they also know, you know, at some point how well they are driving mm. so that it creates a, a more conscious feedback for them, hopefully. Yeah. And what is more important is to create a safer ecosystem. Yeah. And factoring and safety and, and even the cleanliness score because we're sharing the cars. Perhaps one day they could even incentivize that say if you have a high safety score, high cleanliness score, your rent, your hourly rental rates could be slightly lower. Possible. That's one way to go. Yeah. And as a car rental feed, you get a lot of data on users. Yes. Do you see that as an opportunity to work with let's say auto insurance or the financial services industry? to extend your partnerships? So I think for now, we are pretty careful about uh, sharing any of our users data. Mm. Because again, uh, PDPA is a very sensitive topic. Mm. And what is more important now is uh, we haven't yet decided uh, whether if we want to do anything in-house ourselves. Yes. Yeah. So no, we, we haven't gone on that part. But mm. uh, there's no doubt we, we have a lot of data. and. We, the truth is we haven't put a lot of them into good back-end use yet. But now with um, our new owner, there are a lot of plans going on right now that we will be able to make a lot of good, good sense with this data that we have on hand. Yeah. And we also know that across all industries, uh, technology is playing a bigger role. We're using data, it's the new oil. So 10, 20 years ago, the most valuable companies in the world were energy, oil and gas companies. Today, the most valuable companies in the world trade in another commodity, and that's data. Yeah. But data like oil is useless unless it is refined. Exactly. To turn it to analytics. Yes. And with this new direction in the future, how do you see the company having a bigger role when it comes to technology, analytics, to serve the users better? Gobel has, a, a, um, our CEO Arthur, he has a big vision about uh, uh, wanting to put a lot of these data into mobility space. Yeah, and on top of that, the group has a big team of uh, data scientists, you know, and, and research capabilities that they are working on, you know, and with all the various companies of the group that uh, we will be able to interlink, that, that in the near future, it will, I foresee that there's a big synergy that Blue SG can put our part into good use, you know, so that the group can come up with something collectively. And as we look into the future, today, when we think Blue SG, we think EV ride sharing is the island's first major fleet. What do you want people to think about Blue SG, say, two or three years from now? I would like to think, you see, now people know us quite well, mm -hmm. but I don't think we are yet the household brand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some most people know us as Blue SG or SG Blue. It's the same. So, but I think two, three years from now, I like us to be, you know, equivalent to the likes of NTUC maybe in the space of uh, a supermarket, you know, because it is like the household brand to go. So we reckon that, you know, driving is not necessarily everyone's cup of tea, but at least we are one form of the public transport that people can consider that they can alternate from between buses, taking a train, taking a taxi, right healing or passion. Yeah. And we believe, my personal belief is the whole industry is big enough, you know, and, and it is always good to provide our users with that one extra option for them to be able to put the journey in their own safe hands. Yes. yes. You've been in this journey for a very long time in Singapore. You're one of the pioneers. And so a big part of being a pioneer is the tough work of education. Yes. And there's a lot of myths that have been busted over the years. Myths like we were talking about earlier on how could a blue SG car, a blue car go to a highway, yeah. ECP? Could I charge my car during rain? Yeah. So as mindsets mature and evolve, what do you see as the biggest adoption or mindset challenge when it comes to EVs in the next one or two years? Expectation. Okay. 
because you see when you are driving a petrol car the uh, people's mindset is okay i drive amber still can drive 20 kilometers so red okay okay i go to the nearest uh, petrol kiosk to come and five minutes i'm done two i'm ready to go but when it's charging you can't do that whether is it slow charge even if it's a tesla you still need at least 30 minutes to charge 15 30 minutes to charge and you need to find the charging point to charge and it may not be necessarily available yes yes so mindset needs to change yes and and uh, otherwise the driving habits and all is more or less the same but mindset is the biggest thing because when people want to switch to ev their first reaction is oh i must have a charging point downstairs my house then i switch but it's a chicken and egg thing you know uh if you do not how often can you get a charging point downstairs your house if you are staying in a HDB estate, you will be fighting with the rest of HDB dwellers. If you stay in a condo, you will be fighting with your, the rest of the condo residents. The only way if you want to have that mindset is you are, land, you are staying in a landed and you have your own at your porch. But otherwise, is do you first drive, adopt an EV or do you first make sure you have a charging point downstairs your house? Because remember, even that charging point is not yours. Yes. It's not dedicated. Yeah, so I, I think it's really the mindset because once your mindset is tuned correct, even if you do not necessarily have a charging point downstairs your house, as long as it's within walking distance and you know how to manage your expectation and plan your journey well, there's no issue. I agree. Yeah. There are hundreds of EV drivers in Singapore, Tesla, Hyundai, other brands, who do not have a charge point in their homes. They use destination charging in the malls, in offices, in other different locations or even parks like this and one of the big changes with the new ownership is also blue sg's network of charge points so they're currently now with a new owner yes total energies uh, not yet but yeah very soon they'll be transferred they'll, they'll be acquired by total yes what happens what's the impact to blue sg after that uh so we we have a binding agreement with blue charge which is the carve out entity name for all the charging uh, infrastructure. So we do have a binding agreement uh, for a certain number of years that we will continue to be using their charging points. Yeah, so but in the meanwhile, as we expand our fleet, we anyhow need to expand uh, to more charging point operators. So we'll be working with more others as well in the very near future. So potentially like the charge in like a Shell Green Lords or even an SP charger one day. Yes, yes, definitely. Opening up more yes, locations. Yes. That's what I hope, of course. Uh, yes. Another thing that we want to talk about is car ownership in Singapore. So the government's trying to reduce car ownership, and the reality is most cars are in a parking lot 95% of the time. But then with a car sharing company, the utilization is much higher. Yes. Is that true? Yes, because you see, um, essentially, car sharing helps uh, land, use com land use agencies or ministries do better planning for their land. Because uh, if you look at a HDB season parking, for example, one car to one lot. It may not be a fixed lot, but any one car will occupy one lot. And when you are there, it is literally only used by one car. But in a car sharing world, like for Blue SG, a typical station in a HDB estate over a month will serve more than five, 600 unique users. And it's the same four space because the average station is four parking. So each parking station, each, each station with four parking lots serve around 600 different users every month. So you can imagine if car sharing is embraced even more throughout, you know, how much more space can be saved just out of parking lots. Yes. So it's huge. And when we talk about Singapore, we know that car ownership rates are very low, only 11%, which means almost 90% of the population is a potential target audience for Blue SG. Uh, yes and no, because they may not necessarily can drive. Right. Yes. And, and what is frustrating sometimes that I believe, especially when you talk to the younger generations, and they, they don't necessarily want to learn driving. Uh. And then when you ask them, why don't you want to learn driving? Uh, because a car is so expensive in Singapore. You know, but then it's a good skill to have. It's a personal asset once you learn how to drive. So whereas compared to US uh, or in Europe, you, I hardly know people who cannot drive. It's like a rite of passage, like you turn 16, 18, Exactly, boom. exactly. Then after that, whether you, you don't necessarily need to own a car. Yes. Yes, but it is a good skill to have. 
So for the younger generation, I think it's quite sad that they don't even want to consider learning just because the price of the car is so high. Fair. Yeah, but at least with Blue SG, we hope we can give them this sustainable, alternative, affordable option for them to consider without the burden of owning a car. I agree. I do have to say as someone going through driving school myself, <laughs> that Singapore driving school is a bit more hardcore. It's like at least six months of, of work here. <laughs> there's the theory test, there's a practical test, there's the traffic police, driving simulator, your final test. It's a lot, but still, this is a powerful option for all, all those of us who already have a driver's license that we can use. Yes. New drivers will have to wait a while, but otherwise, after you pass the new driver stage, yes, this is a welcoming option. Blue SG has been again a big part of Singapore's EV journey. A pioneer in a true sense, going through all the ups and downs. And we're also thankful for the government support, as Jenny mentioned, both the Economic Development Board and also Land Transport Authority for helping us in this journey. There are other countries where EVs are a lot more predominant. We are working there, we're working hard to catch up. So one final question, fun one. At what Stage, I think what year is your best guess where you'll see more EVs and petrol cars on Singapore's roads? Wow! Maybe 2040, hopefully. Yeah. But that, I think that is in line with what uh, MOT mentioned because they, I, if, if my memory is not wrong, uh, 2030 for up to 60,000 charging points. Yes. And 2040 to phase out to have no more ICE car. Yes. So somewhere along nearer there, you know, uh, uh, we should be though. Though I don't know if will hybrid be counted at some point. Mm, that's yeah. A good question. Yeah. So, but I think that my closest bet will be somewhere around twenty forty. What do you think? So for context, Singapore's government is phasing out petrol and diesel cars by twenty forty. Other countries are doing it a bit earlier. UK by twenty thirty. Norway by 2025. So I think that Singaporeans are very practical. They want a car with good resale value. Yes. So if they buy a car now and thinking 10 years from now, if I sell it, am I gonna is it gonna fetch well? Yes. 10 years from now will be 2032. I think that the transition from EVs to well <laughs> not EVs, the transition from petrol cars to EVs will actually be a lot faster than the deadline. I think that my personal thing by 2030. More than half the cars in the road are EVs by 2040. Wow, okay. Is, I know it's crazy, it's very significant, because this is not counting just new car sales, but existing cars on the road. Today, yes. there are more almost 600,000 private cars in Singapore. Yeah. So we should check the figures again, come nearer to 2030, to see how right you are. <laughs> yes, we will find out, putting my reputation down the line. <laughs> Jenny, thank you so much for this inside look into the world of Blue SG. You're most welcome. I just want to again, today I've learned so much about Blue SG that I wouldn't otherwise have known even a day ago. Thank you for the service to the country, for making it safer wow. for people. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but even one thing that we don't talk about like safety, because the batteries are lower, these kind of cars are less likely to save. It is safer for families. Yep. We're saving the, lives. The car is very stable because the battery is at the base of the car. Yes. We, we see accidents on newspapers, but we don't see when a car saves a life. And there's actually a lot of lives being saved here. You, it's a big part of the government's initiative of the Green Plan 2030. Yes. yes so yes. even if most of us are driving because we love the instant acceleration, no talk, but you're helping do a small part for also our planet. Yes, we try our small part in our small way. Yes. So, thank, thank you for, for inviting. Thank you. If you found this interview useful and you found it enjoyable, please click the like button. Hit subscribe to stay updated to more interviews like this. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.